All right, Jeff Lavecchio, Topher Scott, hosts of the Hockey Think Tank podcast. Welcome to the Next Shift podcast. Thanks for having us. Yeah, man. Let's do it. I'm looking forward to it. Let's go. So the, the icebreaker, the one question we wanted to ask first was when you saw a couple other clowns start a niche hockey podcast, did you have any any thoughts? Uh, I think it's good. I think it's great. Yeah, I think it's uh, – <laughs> I, like, honestly, like when people are trying to put information out there and, and y- you guys know how crazy the hockey world is, right? Like you guys are dealing with it on, on an everyday basis with what you guys are doing. And so I think anytime good hockey people can talk hockey and educate people out there, that's always a good thing. And then I think same for you guys. I mean, you guys have had some awesome guests on and, and been able to talk to some really cool people. And that for us is, is a huge part of it. Just getting able to get better ourselves. And it's almost just like you're allowing people into your room when you're talking to really cool people you know so I, I think it's awesome what you guys are doing and we're really really pumped to be a part of this here today yeah and i don't think we would exist without the uh, hockey think tank existing because i'm an early fan of uh you guys and um definitely looked up to what you guys were doing and we often talk about influence on the sh- on the show and i grew up actually watching tofer in chicago i remember being at ushl games being like <sighs> this little guy is just battling out here so um, and it's funny how it worked with, you know, the podcasting after again, looking up to you guys, but, um, I guess just Topher, if you could talk about like, what, what did it take to reach your hockey goals being a smaller player? Oh, geez. Um, well, first of all, George, I remember coaching against you at St. Lawrence too. So oh, yeah. give That's me a funny. couple of heartaches watching you on video and then coaching against you. So it's pretty funny. It's a small world, yeah, right? Just, just put them in the D zone. You'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> nice tug fest here, boys. Nice. Tug fest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, honestly, like as a smaller player, um, you just, you, you gotta be competitive. I think that's the the biggest thing. And, and I think that's just not for smaller players. I think that's for anybody, but I think any smaller player has to have a little bit of a, a chip on their shoulder, a little bit of a little man syndrome and, you know, have the ability to, when people tell you you're too small or you get cut for you're too small, which happened plenty of times in in my career, you just got to kind of shrug it off and use it as motivation to get better. So I think that that mental aspect is a, is a big part of it. And then just from a hockey playing standpoint, I, I think, um, I think it's always good to be able to see the game, have some hockey sense. I think all smaller players, you just, you have to be better at everything else than everybody else, <laughs> you know, because the size factor isn't there. So, you know, having that competitive edge, being able to see the game. And, and I think where the game is at, uh, today, if, if you can skate, I think that helps too. And, you know, I think what we gleaned from listening to your podcast over the years was that you know everyone has something to say and uh, stand for when it comes to hockey they might see problems they want to solve they have their opinions and by by doing that through you know interviewing people who might have the same or differing perspective I mean like George said that's what kind of prompted us to start um, finding new mediums to share your opinions and you know I've never met you guys before um, but I feel like I know you a bit just from listening to kind of where you stand on certain things. So is that kind of the, the genesis of the think tank podcast as well? Maybe talk a little bit about how it started for you. I think it's hilarious that you guys are talking about us like that, because when Tove sent me your guys, uh, Instagram for your podcast, looking through your guests, I was like, Holy shit. These guys want to have us on. So <laughs> I, I literally said that. So was like, this, you know, it goes both ways. And I, earlier when you said, well, hey, I mean, we still, we, I'd be lying if I didn't say Shrimp was really good on on this podcast. We should reach out to him. Yeah, so, but, you know. but I think that's why it's cool that that you know you said, "Oh, you you mad somebody stole what we're doing?" Like, no. Like, the more people do this, the better. We get more intelligent. Our listeners get more intelligent. Our guests get more intelligent. Like, everyone gains something from all of these types of discussions with people who are passionate or or you know are really good at this thing in the game or outside of the game, but you could bring it into the game. So the um, the more the more people we get talking like this, it's just it's just fun and it's better. And if one person listens and they get better, great. If thousands of people listen, that's also great. Yeah, is it true you guys are cousins too? Is that is that right? We are. And Steve we're born. Bujabi, Doug Bujabi. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are great. You're great at dropping the movie quotes. I was going to ask that at the beginning, some classic ones. But yeah, like take us to the very beginning. Of, like, how did it all start for you guys? Was there just like a moment where you just said, "Hey, we're going to start podcasting," or what? What inspired you to start? 
Uh, it, it was what, what Vex like c- probably two and a half years ago now. I think we did our first one, something like that. Maybe November. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and to be honest with you, like there, there's two things. One, like I started the hockey think tank, um, just through doing Twitter stuff and getting the website and all that. And we're just trying to find ways to to keep providing just education for for people that that want it. Whether you're a parent, whether you're a player, whether you're a coach, whatever. And podcasting, it was like kind of a thing, but not really a thing at that point, you know. And and I always kind of wanted to. Um, and, and <laughs> Jeff's a good personality. Like I kind of wanted to do it, but I'm like, nobody's going to want to just listen to me. So I'm like, I gotta, gotta I gotta find somebody that's the talent, you know, that people want to listen to. And, and Vex was that guy and we're so close. I mean, we were each other's best man at our, at each other's weddings. And, and Jeff's obviously had an unbelievable playing career and journey and gone through lots and ups and downs, just kind of like I have. And so we were like, Hey, why don't we just do this? And, it, and, and so we did it, not having any idea how it was going to go or what it even was. It took me like a year to research, like what microphones to use and how to actually execute doing a podcast because neither of us are very technologically savvy to say the least. Um, but then once we kind of did it, we just, the first one we did, I interviewed Jeff and he just talked about his story and we got some pretty cool people on like Kendall Coyne Schofield and Rico Blasi and Mike Schaefer and, and Robbie Shrimp was kind of the one that, that really elevated it because he was just so raw and open and honest. And that's what we really learned after that is like, people just love when people are authentically themselves, you know, and you don't really get that a lot in, in professional sports. Everybody's kind of buttoned up and hockey. It's that kind of culture. And Jeff and I talk about all the time. We wish people would kind of show some more personality. And uh, so, yeah, we didn't know where it was going. We had no idea what it was, but it's turned out to be something that's the best part of my week that I look forward to every week being able to do this and talk hockey with people that love the game yeah and uh jeff you can touch on this a little bit i was talking to sean before and i just said it's so cool that these guys were you know able to coach and be involved in the game but with their podcast they could take it to another level and build their build their own brands right so you can just talk about what the think tank has i don't know done for you personally in that sense show show your shirt too oh yeah gmbm baby get more be more that's uh Extra like, small, extra small for Jeff. This is actually a large. It's I medium. <laughs> I, I tell him to make my larges, just put large on the tag, but actually give me a small. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, no, the Think Tank's helped uh, uh, build a brand for both Topher and I personally and our own businesses. Um, but to go back really quickly to go over how, how we started the podcast, Tof, I got a call out of nowhere from Tof. And uh, the only podcast I'd ever listened to previously to, to two and a half years ago was Joe Rogan. And I usually watched it when I was playing in Europe, cooking myself dinner. Um, so I'd watch it on YouTube or whatever. Never really listened to them in the car or on my phone. Um, so I get this call from Tof and he's like, you want to start a podcast with me? And me not listening to podcasts, but just loving Tof. I was like, yep. And he's like, wow, that was easy. And I was like, all right, what do we do? And we were like, I, I, I don't know. And Tove learned how to do all of it. He went and registered it. He figured out the the uh, pre-song. And we talked about, you know, what, what do we do now? Did we just talk? And his wife uh, was like, you know, the podcast I listen to, I really like when they always start the same. So that's how Tove came up with the welcome, welcome, welcome that people either love or love to hate. Either way, they're listening. So we don't really Do people care. hate it? That's no, tough. I think. No, like, you know, but it's funny. It. It's funny. Like we listening it. to your podcast, Tof. Like I, I picked up on. Okay, he starts at the same every time. Like, what's my opener gonna be? And I mean, it's just. So we're all right. still looking for it. Yeah, we're still trying to figure it out. But, um, yeah, Jeff, I'll let you finish George's question there, but and try to maybe weave this this answer in. You know, and to both of you, um, was there when you first started out, right? Um, talking about hockey and and doing kind of a retrospective with your guests on what they learned from the game. There's that like cathartic element, right? Where you're doing kind of the post-op on your own career. And it's kind of a, an an ongoing process. Um, But do you feel like because of the podcast, you were able to maybe more formally like put a bow on each of your playing career? Because you, you did the work on figuring out what happened, what did I learn and what am I going to bring forward with the people I interact with. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, I mean, I personally never been to a uh, therapy, but I think probably everyone needs to go. And Tove talks about it all the time on our show that, mm-hmm. he, that he's been to therapy before and he thinks it's super helpful. And 
I speak all the time about sports psychology and how I think every player who wants to get an edge should go speak to a sports psychologist. It's insane the things you can learn about yourself, about reflection and all the things like that. So we all, we both believe in, you know, reflecting daily, monthly, weekly, yearly, and going over our career, being able to reflect back. I think it's super helpful. Um, you know, I, I listen to a lot of uh, motivational speakers and, and people that help businesses grow. And they're always like, look at who does what, what you want to do. You know, for me, like, look at, I look at Mike Boyle, who I think is like the best hockey trainer in the world. And I'm like, okay, well, what is he doing? How is he having so much success? What does he do? And then I learn, I, I kind of emulate that formula until I can kind of make it my own. Right. And so for us, we basically do that with our podcast. We talk, you know, we both made it pretty far in hockey. If you look at how many kids actually get to play division one hockey, it is a very small number and then go on to pro and sign NHL contracts. We made it pretty far. So for us to be able to reflect back and help people with, Oh, you know what? Just talking it out. You know what? I did. I didn't do this. Me. I didn't watch enough hockey. If I can tell the really good kids out there who don't watch hockey, I promise you, if you watch hockey, you'll get better right now. That's one thing that will make you better. And then they do it. Like, that's amazing for me. It makes me feel better about my career too, for, you know, I want not accomplishing what I ultimately wanted to accomplish. I'm very happy with my career, but so that's something that I'll always struggle with a little bit, but this definitely helps with that. And when I can help someone get a little further than maybe they wouldn't have without the advice or the training or anything like that, it makes me feel so good. Yeah. And before we get to the life after hockey and considering both of your careers, um, you know, looking back on my own career, I, I played college in a, in a little bit, of, you know, a year of pro. And what advice would you guys give to, you know, that transition from college to pro because it's just such a it's it's a business right and i just think it's such a actually all right let me start over there i'll have to cut that out now i'm gonna have to edit that <laughs> no oh, I'll, edit, I'll edit this one <laughs> <laughs> yeah so before we get into life after hockey guys um we, jeff you were just talking about you know advice for current players what what advice would you give for players maybe transitioning out of college to pro um there's no doing too much. That's not a thing. Like everyone in the room with you and everyone in the league that you're in and the leagues above you and below you are all looking for the exact same thing. So you literally need to go all in. You need to establish your reasoning for why you're doing this, what you're doing, and then how you're doing it. Like you cannot search too much. Like I remember playing in the American League, had NHL signing bonus for two years, had a pretty good amount of money starting out. And I look back and I'm like, why didn't I seek out like a, a personal video coach? Why didn't I seek out a sports psychologist to go to talk to once a week? Like if that would have cost me an extra $3,000, $5,000 a year, who cares? I would have been a billion times better. And I could look back and say, like, I, I, with what I knew then I did everything I could, but knowing what I know now, it's like, man, I could have been doing that. I could have been calling Tof, calling all my old coaches, sending them video. Like there is not doing too much because your window to make it in professional hockey is literally a sliver of your life. So give it everything you have and see what happens. I think, I think the other thing too is like, you got to be able to control what you can control and, and that's what you have to have your focus on. You know, I look at, at my career and had a very successful college career, um, captain for two years and scored a hundred points and was on cloud nine. Um, but being five foot four and, and not being as good as you need to be at, at, at five foot four, you know, I didn't have any AHL teams calling me. I didn't have any advisors calling me. And, uh, you know, my first year pro, uh, I signed my contract a one way with an East coast league team. And I started off as the first line center and playing a ton in training camp and ended up when the AHL guys got cut and they started coming down, ended up being released it, within two, two, three months, whatever it was. And, and so you have to understand that there are just, there are things out of your control. And that's one of the things I look back that I wish I would have done differently is I wish I would have just sucked it up a little bit more and said, Hey, control the things that you can control and not be pissed off about the system. Um, and I would have been probably a better hockey player if I would have done that. And I would have been a lot happier uh, as well and more fulfilled with, with what I was doing. So I just think controlling what you can control is, is such a big part of that. Yeah. And then, I mean, we all kind of give our lives to the game, right. And then kind of the blink of the eye, 
it's all over. So were you guys prepared for that end or, and then how did you deal with that transition in life after hockey? So it's interesting. I've, I've kind of had two transitions, right? Like I had a transition from player to coach and then I had a transition, um, from, from coach to something else, which is where we're at right now with the hockey think tank. And there were two very different ones because when I went from player to coach, I had a kind of like a plan B already set up. So I knew when I played my last game that year that I was going to be coaching as a graduate assistant at Miami of Ohio that next year. So I already kind of had something set up. And then when I ended up leaving coaching at Cornell, I didn't really have a plan B. I didn't know what I was going to do next. And that was really hard um, because then you're trying to soul search. You're trying to figure out what you want to do. You're trying to balance family and, and career and, and all of these different kind of things. And that was much more tough than the first one. So I would say that like, I think even pro hockey players now have other interests and the studies are showing that if you don't just think about hockey all the time, you're going to be a better hockey player. Like you have to have other hobbies, other interests so that when you get to the rink, you're a little bit more refreshed and ready to go and, and things like that. So if I were to give any advice to people that were transitioning, I would say, Hey, like start looking at what that next step is going to be. Don't just get to the final day and be like, all right, where do I go now? What do I do next? Because um, for me, just from my experience, like that was difficult time. And it took me a lot of uh, time to, to really try and figure that out. For me, for me, it was a little bit different. Um, I, I, so I signed my NHL contract uh, after my junior year, went and played in the AHL, played really well, but I fractured my wrist, wound up finding out in the summer, I tore my TFCC, which is cartilage. So I had to wear this like gunslinger thing for a few months. My first time back on the ice, I hit a massive bump on the ice, went head first in the boards, got a concussion, missed my whole first year and a half pro. So that kind of set me up. You know, I, I thought I was never going to play again. I wound up playing nine years after that, but I kept getting concussions, some bad ones after that as well. So after my third year pro, uh, I decided I was going to go to Europe. I just had another bad concussion and I was like, you know, and I'm just going to try and make as much money as I can and until I'm not healthy, you know, or I think it's a better idea to retire. So that summer going into playing over in Europe, I decided, all right, I'm going to start an off ice training company. Um, I went to school for exercise science. I got certified. The only reason I was able to play hockey above midgets was because I got into to training and bettering myself in different ways. So I started this company uh, just in the off season and every year it started growing and growing and growing and going into my 10th year pro, I worked with, uh, I think it was like, 250, 300 people that summer. Cause I did a couple big camps and then all of my personal clients and then groups and teams and all these things. And so it got to a point where it's like, all right, if I, I'm, I'm getting concussions and I'm now I'm like helping so many people and this is making a, my, my summer business was making quite a bit of money too. So it was like, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's time to give it up. Um, so after my 10th year, I decided to make that decision, even though I was still getting good contract offers, but with the amount of concussions I had, it was always something in the back of my head, always from that first one before my first year pro started. So I knew it was coming. Um, so I knew my last game was going to be my last game going into it. That was a very weird, so weird, weird. such a weird experience. And, uh, you know, I kept my Jersey on as long as I could. And I stayed in the locker room as long as I could. And I was just like, wow, like my life will never, ever, ever ever be the same. I'll never have a one, one or two hour work day again. <laughs> you know? What do you, what do you guys think about this too? Like I think about this all the time because I just recently, so coaching a, an 18 U team, I just recently, we've been having injuries and people playing high school and all this kind of stuff. So we've been a little bit low on numbers in our practices. So I've been jumping in and drills and stuff. I am at my happy place. I am legitimately in my happy place when I am in those drills. And it's like, you know, way back in the day. So I don't know what you guys think. Like Vex, I know you don't like to put the equipment on much and stuff, but I do feel like a lot of, some people like just want to throw their bag away and they don't even want to look at a hockey rink when their career is over. But then I feel like there's other people, like for me, it's almost been like a void in my life that's been filled in this past month, just like going in these drills and like hopping in on the power play and, you know, doing all the things that I so. I'm, I'm going to let you, I'm going to let Sean touch on the question, but yeah. in terms of the, like jumping into the drills, every drill, every chance I get, I am in, I'm, I'm breaking the puck out. I'm regrouping, especially when we only have, and I was like nervous at first, but I'm like, Hey, if they're not going to listen to me, then I might as well show them. Right. So go ahead, Sean. Yeah. That, but that was a weird, a weird revelation for me. Cause how it ended for me was we've talked about it a bit the last few weeks, but I had 
what I would explain as the yips for about 18 months uh, before I stopped playing hockey. Couldn't catch a pass, fighting everything. And people just call it, oh, you're fighting the puck. But it, I really believe it's no different than, you know, that sec Chuck Knobloch not being able to throw it from second to first, right? And so then you're you're resentful, you don't like the sport. And and I had the opportunity to get back and coach a junior Eagles midget team last year. You go out there, you're the drew and the magic kind of come back comes back. So it was a cool juxtaposition for me to to realize, like, geez, I mean, this that never went away. It's just kind of the lens that you look at everything through. Like you're trying to fight your way out of something where you just need to believe the pressure and enjoy it and connect back to what you love about it. And so that's been something I've been thinking about the last few weeks, but I wanted to ask you both, you know, the playbook for a guy who's approaching retirement has seemingly been, okay, I'm going to reach out to people in my network, see who I should be meeting for coffee to figure out what's next. I mean, that's, I don't want to make too general of a statement, but I've learned in, you know, this doing this podcast and posting on Instagram and posting on Twitter that you can make that process scalable by putting yourself out there online. And you guys, I know it feeds Topher your path towards, you know, climbing the coach ranks and Jeff, you, you know, getting clients and developing programs for guys. So just making the seemingly unscalable scalable. So maybe looking back, like what advice would you give to that guy who's just about to retire and has to figure out what's next? I guess for me, um, like like you said, I didn't have Instagram um, when I played because I thought it was a distraction. And it can be a distraction. Yep. There's no doubt about that. But there are so many companies now that some of my pro guys have met with to help them with their social media, to teach them how to use it for their advantage. Like you, you it doesn't matter what league you're in. You're a professional athlete, even a division one athlete. You have fans. You have people that look up to you. You are something. You had to put in work to get to that elevated level that most people will never reach. So I, I personally believe you should leverage that. Um, you know, there are Connor Carrick, unbelievable yep. example. I, I tell all my players, look at Connor Carrick's Instagram. Connor Carrick is probably going to make more. And, I, and it's not all about money, but Connor Carrick's probably going to make more money post hockey, just like Paul Bissonnette than he did in hockey playing in the NHL because he, fans are buying into him as a person. So and, now whatever you know, he's, he does, he's just real quick. I mean, he's on the taxi squad right now. Yeah. Like 99% I know. of got, percent of players on Instagram, in the NHL, if they got sent down or put on waivers, they're going into their shell. You're right. not going to see them rest of the season. This guy owns it, posts about it. And, and that drives his value to the people he's, he's communicating with. Even more, that vulnerability, be yourself. I mean, I have some young guys that are just breaking into the NHL, and I'm like, I, you don't have to be me because they see me on Instagram. I'm like, you don't have to be me, and you shouldn't be me on Instagram. Be you, whatever you like, post about it. Could be once a week, could be once a day, could be once every, like whatever it is. Show the people that follow you because you have instant fans, instant following, instant people who will want to help you post hockey. If you like hunting, post about hunting. I guarantee you some hunting company is going to reach out to you and be like, hey, you know, you like hunting. Let's let's collab on something. And then now all of a sudden you're a guy who sells hunting gear post hockey. And you started that because you put a hunting picture on your Instagram. I think that they just need to use leverage who they are a lot more and use social media to their advantage without it taking over their lives, obviously. Vex, it's so funny you mentioned that that hunting thing. I literally two weeks ago I had an NHL scout reach out to me, and he's got a couple buddies that play in the NHL, and they want he, he reached out to me because they want to start a hunting podcast. I'm not even kidding you. That's so funny. <laughs> there you go, man. Yeah. yeah, I do. But Sean, to your to your point, like. I don't think it, when you talk about a transition and we talk about this all the time on our podcast, I, I don't think there's anything better than personal relationships that can get you anywhere in, in this sport. And so the better of a person you are, the more ver vulnerable you are and you're willing to reach out to people. Like I do think social media, you can use it as a vehicle, but there's no substitution for getting to know somebody and then that person sure. trusting you. And then, you know, that person knows somebody else who, and so just through those, connections and relationships and, and, and everything. I just think, you know, don't be afraid to put yourself out there and reach out to people. Don't be afraid to try new things. Um, and then you'll kind of figure it out from there. Yeah. And, and I, I probably bring that up on this podcast too much, but I've just, 
the last year or so learned and, and kind of accepted the power of the internet and networking. And, you know, you'll have friends ask, how'd you get Chris Pronger on there? Well, I DM'd him and then he came on and we got to know him a little bit. And, and so to kind of cultivate your network, like you said, Tof, um, such a huge thing. And, and I just try to advocate for guys not um, closing themselves off on, online. Well, and, and two, the other thing I wanted to add to that is like in the off season, you work two hours a day. You work, you go and train and you take multiple days off during the week. So before you go golfing, send a message to somebody in a field that you are interested in. And again, leverage who you are. Hey, I'm so-and-so. I play for so-and-so. Is there any chance I could shadow you? I'm really interested in learning about this stuff. Like that will fuel your passion. And it's like Tof said, um, I can't remember the guy's name who came on our podcast, but he works for the NHL and he's done studies where the guys who do stuff outside of hockey during the season are now having more successful seasons. And like, it's literally like they have the data showing that. So not only are you going to make yourself a more successful player by you opening up new pathways in your brain and doing all these things are going to make you more intelligent. You're also setting yourself up for your future, whether you're, you know, uh, uh, Connor Carrick, who probably makes a couple million over his career or Sidney Crosby, who makes 150 plus million. There's going to be time after hockey, a lot of time. So you got to figure out what you want to do with yourself. So learn and, and develop those passions and skills and networks now while you're still playing and you have the leverage. Yeah, I think you make a great point there in, in being proactive. And, I, and a mistake I made after and some guys absolutely make is that they just assume that it will come because you what you accomplish in your hockey career, right? And you quickly find out that if you don't put yourself out there, nothing will come back, right? It's true. That's a hundred percent true. And, uh, you know, I learned that lesson becoming, a, a an assistant coach at Cornell, like, you know, you got to make cold calls <laughs> and you got to put yourself out there. You got to be able to be okay being told no, you know, some of the hardest things is going to recruit those blue chip athletes who, you know, aren't going to say yes to you, but you got to put yourself out there and, <laughs> and, and try to recruit them anyway. And it's the same when you're getting outside of hockey, like you got, you have to put yourself out there and, and that's not easy. That's not easy for anybody, even NHL players who everybody knows who they are. <laughs> right. Well, actually, I wanted to transition a little bit. Being a Bruins fan, I know you guys had Trent Frederick on the other day. So what can you guys tell yeah. us, tell our audience about his story? Because I, I absolutely love this guy. He seems like an animal on the ice. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, Freddie's a beast. I've been training him for, for two years now. And, uh, like, literally, it's if you knew him as a person, you would never – think that he would be the same person. Like I I'm obviously played with and know a lot of like fighters from the NHL, AHL, heavyweight, super tough human beings. They're always the nicest guy in the room, you know, but like Trent is literally like the nicest, sweetest kid ever. And then he gets on the ice and somebody hits him and he's just like, bah! like it's, it's unbelievable. What's but, he like? Yeah. Bah! Like, ah, just, okay. like, like different sure. person, like literally like, uh, 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 Jekyll and Hyde. It's unbelievable, but you know, it's really cool to see a guy go all in. Like I train people pretty hard and pretty intensely and it's not just in the gym. I'm talking to them on the weekends. I'm asking what they're eating, talking about, you know, how much or how little they're partying and all these different, like it's all encompassing. What can we do every little thing to get more out of you? Cause like you're at that, you're, you're on the, the peak. Like we got to keep you there. And uh, he did everything, man. He has done everything the last two years. So to see someone get it, having this much success in the city of Boston, absolutely just eating him up and loving him and knowing how good of a person he is. And everyone says, oh, he's such a good person about their friends. Like, no, no, this guy, there, there are stories that I won't even tell. And he's literally like shirt off your back, unbelievable human. So it's very cool to see his success. One of the other things I wanted to ask is, I, you know, I think we do have some crossover when it comes to hockey parents maybe listening. Um, we try to save the parents for, for you guys. But for anyone listening, what's what's the theme? What's the punchline for them in, in terms of the do's and don'ts? I, I think, honestly, the biggest thing is like – it goes back to Jeff. I mean, he's got it up on his wall in his gym and we talk about it all the time. It's like, what's your why? 
know, why did you put your kid in youth sports? Was it to make sure that they become the best hockey player ever and be Sidney Crosby? Or was it because, you know, you wanted your kid to get some exercise and have some fun and make friends and, and build a little bit of a community? Um, I, I think the, the why part of it gets lost on a lot of people because we put our kids in youth sports at six, seven years old and, you know, we put them in for the right reasons. And then sometimes the, what I call the machine just eats you up <laughs> and then you get caught up in it and, you know, you you don't know where to go and who's next and, and all that kind of stuff. So I think it's, it's just remember your why. And then the other thing is like, hey, look, everybody's got a different path like every kid is different some kids mature physically more uh quicker than others some mature mentally more than others you know some kids have different social groups that they're involved with that's going to pull them in different directions sometimes your kid maybe is better at something else so maybe they want to be a baseball player or a, in the band or whatever and they don't want to be a hockey player like you so desperately want them to be so i, I just think the biggest thing is like just like listen like, listen to your kid. Are they having fun? Are they enjoying it? What do they enjoy about it? Are they tired? Like, are you pushing them too much? Are you not pushing them enough? Like, like we all want what's best for our kids. So we got to listen. We got to understand that everybody has a different path and just like understand why and think about why you put your kids in youth hockey. And I bet you there's a lot of parents that would hear that and be like, oh yeah, I gotta, I gotta remember that, you know, because it is the machine chews you up and spits you out and it's you thought he's pretty crazy right now but that's uh just remember your why yeah the one thing i've seen is that or that i try to tell parents that the grass isn't always greener on the other side right it seems like everyone's always looking past where they currently are so jeff or either one of you guys you just touch on you know the importance of maybe fighting through situations that might not seem great yeah i mean i don't i don't have kids so it's a lot easier for me to talk about it but i'm also talking about it coming from a place of having gone through it and, and making it to higher levels and all those things tov does have kids they haven't gone through it but you know same idea um like the, the biggest thing is to stop and take a breath if you're about to go scream at that coach because your kid didn't play on the power play and he's eight stop <laughs> Look in the mirror, take a breath. Actually, if a coach if a coach is benching people for power play at eight, yeah, maybe they you should know, go I, you know what I mean though. Like, <laughs> like you're gonna go fight another dad in the parking lot <laughs> because of a penalty his son took. Stop, take a breath, look in the mirror. That's a kid's game. Like it's just so important to think about you know, bring perspective into the situation. Why are we doing this? And and without without ever stymieing your kids' goals or their dreams or their beliefs or, 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 you know, their wants, like you want to push them, but you also got to know that like not many people are going to make it to the NHL, like a very small percentage. It doesn't mean if that they're good and they're going after it, you don't support them. You do everything you can, but remember that because of that, the goal with this is like, you can use sports to help your kid become an unbelievable human, a hard worker, someone who's on time, responsible, giving, caring, a leader, a good follower. Like there's so many things that hockey will, will give them. If you focus on that versus beating the Millers down the street or over in the other city, you know? So I just think, remember your why focus on those things. And when you get crazy, which will happen, stop and take a deep breath. And then at what age do you think this goes for player, parents and players? What age should the player be advocating for himself? I know Sean talks about this a lot, that the player needs to kind of go talk to the coach if there's an issue. Topher? Is there an age? I, I, that, that's you know, true. That's I don't know. True. Maybe maybe the parent could be in the room with them. Um, but I, I think that's a lesson that can be learned at, at the youngest of ages and you guys know playing at the higher levels and, and I've coached in college. Like I, I feel like the kids who had the confidence to walk in the door and advocate for themselves, it a hundred percent translated into life and it a hundred percent translated onto the ice. Like those kids that were self-assured and they knew, they, they knew that coming into that conversation, they might not agree with what they were going to hear because we were going to be honest in our assessment with them. Um, but either way, like those kids just had a confidence and, and not even, I'm not even talking about like just a life confidence to themselves that I think are going to suit them 
forever once hockey is even done. And this, I know that's what you guys talk about a ton on this podcast is life after hockey and how important that like learning things while you're going through this process are to living a fulfilling life after hockey. And I just feel like that advocation for yourself and being able to have that confidence, man, that goes a long way. And so as parents, if you can help to instill that in, in your kids, even I would say it, it, I I don't even know if there's an age where you should start. Yeah. (laughs) And Topher, I think what's really cool is that if you, so, you know, you're going to continue coaching and, and I'm not sure what, what the goal is, but if I'm a 16, 17, 18 year old kid that finds out I'm playing for you next year, like I can go find what you're all about. And so before I meet you in the locker room, that first day, you're eliminating the guesswork. And then I think that's laying the foundation for, for your players to be able to interact with you in a more personal way and creating that level of access and comfort for them to problem solve directly with you. If, if there is an issue. Um, and, and I wanted to get your take on that, Jeff, too. Like what um, we, we had a question here about how the think tank has helped you, you know, increase people's access to you, but also like your own personal brands. Right. And, and you, you have your, your, think tank podcast kind of insulates your, your personal brand. So it comes across as less self-serving, right? It's not like you're just firing up Instagram live and talking directly from your own account. Um, but wanted to get your take on how it's driving those other, uh, goals you have professionally. I mean, I think that it probably lends me credibility because if there's people who, you know, the think tank gives me an op- a platform to talk about the things that I've learned. And, and, you know, I always say, I love talking to older people, you know, grandparents, people who are 20, 30 years, my senior, I love sitting down and um, having drinks or dinner with people like that because they have wisdom. Wisdom comes from experience. Uh, I have a lot of experiences through my journey of hockey, you know, playing in 8 billion different countries in two countries where they didn't even speak English. Like I have all these crazy experiences that forced me to develop skills that a lot of people maybe don't develop, but then also just give me, it gives me a platform to tell people what I did, because if you're not at some NHL superstar, odds are like, except maybe in your town around your age, plus or minus five years, people don't know who you are. You're irrelevant. You know, even though I was one of the first, pro guys to make it out of St. Louis in a number of years. Nobody now knows that. So the hockey think tank elite that it gives me some credibility. People can listen to my story. Oh yeah. Oh, he's the guy who has on a lot of pro hockey players. He played pro hockey. He's on the think tank. He's helping people. And number one, I didn't never knew that this would happen. Like that, that the think tank would be this big. I didn't do it for that reason. I did it because Toph and I both like helping people and we wanted to get smarter for free. Um, so, you know, so selfishly and, and, but mostly just help other people and, and, you know, put some good out into the world in the hockey world. And, it's like my saying is GMBM, give more, be more, you know, given more with this podcast and winds up helping me out by more people finding out that I do online training and you can train smarter than going to some random personal trainer. And they know to look for me because they heard me on the think tank. I need a program. I need a program for a soon to be 33 year old dad. That's slowly starting to get way too out of shape. Let's go. Even though you probably wouldn't have, you know, I carry it well. That, yeah, I would never guess that. No, I need, I need, a mat, I need like a bulking program. Oh, dude, I got you that. Know? Send me your yeah, email yeah. after this. Oh, Vex, it. Vex has got that. Oh, yeah, he's got that. Dude. <laughs> yeah. He's got the meat workout for sure. Yeah. <laughs> It, but I want to piggyback off what, what what Vex said too, because I think one of the biggest things, and and Sean, we actually talked about this a couple weeks ago when we talked. Like Vex and I are not afraid to air it out there, and the bumps and the lows too, you know, and and. Uh, <sighs> Everybody has them, but like nobody wants to talk about them, right? Because it's hard. It's hard to put yourself out there. It's hard to be vulnerable. But at the end of the day, I think I've connected more with a lot of people from talking about the low points than I have in connecting with people talking about the high points in my career, in my personal life. And so like that for me has been 
really inspiring and, and wants me to continue doing this because like, you know, one of the episodes, I can't remember which one it was Vex, but like I admitted that I have gone to therapy, <laughs> you know, and go to therapy and how great it's been in, in my transition to being a dad. And, and just like we had talked about before and the amount of messages that I got from people after that episode saying, thank you. And like, I can't believe you did that. Like for me, that's what it's all about. Like we can, you can help people kind of get out of the the lows um because it's easy to talk about the highs but like i feel like we've been able to do that and i know just a lot of our feedback that we get like people appreciate that um and it's it is like it's hard to to do but at the end of the day like it's i think that's been a huge piece of of us growing is just like not being afraid to talk about the tough stuff too yeah has there been any uh, negative feedback at all like even at the start when you when you know, even if it came from buddies, like, okay, what do these who do these guys think they are? Biz and wit, anything like that? <laughs> uh, no, I think honestly, the only negative feedback I got is when I talked about how Ralph Kruger should not be fired from the Sabers. And oh, you should, that was dead on. Uh, You're. <laughs> I, I agree with everything you wrote in that blog post. Oh, I triggered the Sabers you're, fans. You were pretty subtle time. too, like. You weren't. You didn't hammer them that bad, but everything you said was true. <laughs> hey, speaking of the lows, though, I want to talk about the depression that sets in in life after hockey if you don't work out, Jeff. So, can you talk about keeping your body active after you hang up the skates for us? I think this is so massively important. I'm so glad that you just brought that up because if you think about, especially you know, you play junior up to juniors, but especially if you play college, because that's going to go four more years after juniors, and then especially even more so if you play pro after our bodies release all these positive chemicals into our brain that make you feel good when you exercise, especially intense, vigorous exercise. And that's what hockey is and then training for it. So you're doing it all the time, your whole life. And then so many guys who well, it's usually the lazier guys, let's not lie. They're, they're like, Oh, I can't wait to not train whatever. And they stop training and they stop having those positive chemicals released in their brain. I know so many guys who they gain a bunch of weight um, after, and you know, that sucks. And they're not happy about that, which makes them more depressed, but it's kind of chicken or the egg. It's like they start to get depressed. So they gain weight, they gain more weight. They, they keep getting depressed and it compounds like this till they're 30 pounds heavier. They feel her in a hole. They're, they're super depressed. And it's like, if you just kept exercising, you would feel so much better. And, and one thing that I did when I retired, I trained so intensely my whole life from when I started training at 16 till I retired at 32, the first like six months, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to even, and I'm a strength coach. Like this is my job. I was like, I'm not going to train like an athlete. I'm going to go in there and do things that I never did as a hockey player. And I would never do because I knew it wouldn't, didn't matter. didn't make me good. I did some like for fun stuff, some bodybuilding stuff, just like go in, have fun, like not, no pressure. And it was unbelievable. And then after that, I did that, I was like, well, this is hilarious and stupid after a couple months, but it just, it kept it fun and different for me when I was getting out of hockey. And then I got back into training like an athlete. And now that I don't play hockey, I feel amazing when I go to that gym for the hour, hour and a half. And I train like an athlete for the most part. I'm not going as, in, I'm not out there running 300 yard shuttles in the public gym and, you know, snapping pre-workout and going crazy, but like, I'm still going hard and you feel good and you feel like you did when you played. It's funny because I was just thinking, usually I try to ride the bike before I, uh, you know, jump on the pod here. And today I didn't work out before and I'm just, I'm fighting it. Like I can't formulate a scent. It's so true. It just, <laughs> well, you gotta give you Jordan, all right, man. You Jordan all right. Toast, like you guys are in the rinks a lot. I'm in the rinks a lot. And sometimes that, that snack bar pizza can be tough to pass up. <sighs> oh, dude, you're t- like try recruiting. Try recruiting and going in and leaving a rink at 1030 at night and nothing's open except the gas station or a Wendy's, you know, and do you decide to go to the gas station and have, you know, peanuts for dinner and some like something out of a gas station or you just do the ease. I'm tired. I'm going to just go to Wendy's. That's, I ask, that's actually a good question. Like, cause I feel like in order to do that, you have to prioritize your health. And I feel like, especially when you get older, you have kids, you got a job, all this kind of, we have so many different priorities, right? That we, we always, I shouldn't say we always, but I feel like a lot of people, myself included, kind of put our health on the back burner. Like that's, you know, that's something that's not that important because I have all these other things to tend to. Like, what would you say to people that have that? I would say, look back at your playing career when you didn't prepare 
when you didn't practice, when you didn't work out, when you didn't visualize, how'd you play? And then how'd you play when you did? Immensely better. You're either preparing to succeed or you're preparing to fail every single, single day. You prepare to fail by not preparing. So for me, I think people need to make, and this is what I've done um, since retiring, is like I make an appointment in my calendar just like I do for all of my training sessions or a podcast like this or a call later I have today. In my calendar, I have a time that I go to the gym. That is my time. It's just like any other appointment, calendar, something I'm being paid for that I have to do. It's a priority in my life because I know that once I stop doing that, I will not be able to, to do as much as I do. And if you have kids, like I say to my mom and dad, I'm like, I tell them, it, it goes back to everything. Figure out your why. If you have kids, I, I don't know how your why wouldn't be like, I want to be as healthy as I can for my kids as long as I can. I want to be able to play with them. I want to be able to teach little Johnny how to skate. I want to be able to teach him how to be in the gym. I want to take him to his first junior tryout. Like I want to be there for him. And if you're not healthy, you're, you're not going to be there as long. You're not going to be able to do as much. You're not going to be able to play one-on-one -on -one with them in the basement when you're 30, you know, 45 years old, whatever it is. So like find out your why, and then it's all preparing for me. You know, obviously I know recruiting is hard. You're driving all over the place. All I heard was excuses. Tell like bring a protein shake in your bag with a banana, stop at the grocery store before and get some healthy food <laughs> and find that freaking dog. <laughs> There you go. I, I need the movie quotes to keep going. Um, this is just one just popped in my head, Topher. I think it might turn into a good one. Um, what is What do people get wrong about leadership? And is it right for 12-year-olds to have a C or an A on their jersey? Oh, wow. Uh, what do people get wrong about leadership? Um, uh, I'll, I'll say what you don't want to say. Just because someone was a first-round pick. Uh, and they're 18, you shouldn't make them a captain of an NHL team. Ooh, there you go. Yeah. Reading, reading between the lines there. I, yeah. I got you. Ralph Kruger, is that your? Uh, yeah. is that where you yeah. were going? <laughs> yeah, just follow Sabres in general. No, because I was just talking to a, a parent, and they, they just made the point to me. They go, there's no way that uh, 12, 13-year-olds should have a, a C or an A on their jersey. And I go, maybe you're right, actually, because I remember being a captain when, you know, at, around that age, and I didn't really understand what it meant to, to be a captain, right? That's something, that's something you learn you know, maybe later in your career, maybe later in life. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it's necessarily a bad thing to have captains on youth teams. If I were to go about it, I would probably name them in the middle of the season and I would have the team and the players vote for him, not the coach giving them to anybody. So then the kids get to know each other and, and it's, it's their team, right? Like if a coach says, okay, you know, little Johnny who Jeff just talked about, you're the best player. I'm going to give you the C like that's, he, we talked about this yesterday, Vex on our podcast, like nothing is earned anymore. Everything is given, right? Like you have to earn the C you have to earn the A and you do that by leading by example, especially at the younger ages. Like, and if you can, um, as a coach, provide that to the kids because, hey, you earned this letter or whatever because you were such a great teammate. And as a coach, you can even say, like, these are the things that we're looking for in a leader, in a captain. And you talk nothing about goals or assists or whatever, but you talk about being a great person. You talk about being selfless. You talk about doing the little things on the ice, everything that a leader should be. Um, then I, I don't necessarily think that that's a, a bad thing, but it is a bad thing if, you know, at your first practice, the coach goes into the locker room and says, okay, you three guys who are leading scores last year, you're, you're the captains now. Now you've just made those kids entitled because they got it off of nothing other than their talent. What about maybe even taking it a step further? And I don't know what age you would start this at, but you could employ this strategy earlier uh, in a younger ages is the, you explain what a captain is, what they do, why they're a captain, all those things. Tell yeah. Them. What does Sidney Crosby do? Like, yeah, what, yeah. Do, like what, like look at what they do, right? You have yeah. to teach them what a captain is, why they're a captain, how they're a captain. So you have to teach that first um, and, and illustrate it. And maybe like the first half of the season, you say, okay, the first half of the season, we're going to rotate captains every game. So now we'll see how you guys are as leaders. Everyone else, when you don't have an A, you know, you're following. And then say, and, and the last 10 games of the year, we're going to vote on captains for who you guys think did the best job as the captain throughout the whole year or was the best leader or whatever. Maybe now it's teaching them leadership skills because, you know, again, the game is teaching them for life. Like 
A lot of kids are afraid to talk to adults. Well, now you're the captain. You have to talk to the ref. And maybe you make it a point to where, and just teaching kids to be good kids, uh, before the game, you're the captain. You go up and shake the, the ref's hands and say, hi, I'm Johnny so-and-so. I'll be the captain for today if there's anything you need. That ref will be blown out of his skates, and you probably get better calls. So, you know, you're getting a couple bounces there too. Then you're teaching the kids leadership. At the end of the year, now you can have the team name captain so that they can see, you know, how it worked. Yeah, and, and, a, and a big reason why I started listening to you guys is because I wanted to become a better coach. And then I, I remember you guys would always say it's almost like starting over, right? From no matter, no matter how long you played, you get into your first year of coaching and it's almost like an oh shit moment, right? So what advice would you give to you guys yourselves as young first year coaches? I, I think the 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 best coach is the one that's the best version of themselves and i think that that's a mistake that i made as a player when i became a captain of my team and also when i became a coach is that i feel like you know at the time i thought that i needed to be this certain kind of leader for our team to be, and it came from a good place but it was the wrong thing because i thought i needed to kind of like lay the hammer down or you know be tough on people and that's just not who i am that's not really my personality and so like i think i lost some respect from certain people that i treated in a way that i wouldn't have naturally treated them because i thought it was what they needed if that makes any sense um in holding them accountable in a certain way and maybe being hard on them in certain ways rather than taking them out to lunch or just certain things that are much more into who my DNA is. And so that's, that's like what I love to talk about is like, you have to, again, it goes back to what's your why. And also like, you got to be the best version of you. Don't try to be somebody like that, that you're not like, I can't try to be like Mike Babcock. <laughs> that's, it's not going to work. And Jeff can't try to be like me and I can't try to be like anybody else. So, um, be your authentic self. That's the best thing that you can do as a leader for your team. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that too. I mean, I, uh, I was a captain everywhere I went and I always did things differently than everyone else, you know, especially I was super into training. I was super into nutrition and back when Tof and I were coming up and in juniors and stuff like that wasn't really a thing yet. And so like the boys gave me, you know, a hard time all the time. I had coaches who would rip up, you go, oh, Vex, you got your water bottle, oh, oh. you know? And it's like, oh, you're, it's funny, but it's like, uh, be yourself because then People, no matter what, even in the beginning, if they're like, what's this guy? Like, they respect that. You know, like I think about when I went to Japan and everyone, you know, it's a much different country there. And I played two years, two years there. And uh, I'm out there being the exact same I am all the time, yelling, getting the boys going, you know, trying to create a competition out of every single drill and, you know, yelling F you to the other team. And like, we're going to beat you getting the boys going. These Japanese guys have never had that. And they're just like, what? But then they realize like, Oh, that's just how he is. And they bought into it. And our team like won a championship that year and, and, and did great things. And it's just like, the more you are authentically yourself, whatever that means, whatever your style is, people believe in you. And the more they believe in you, the more they're going to buy into whatever your coaching, selling, doing, whatever it is. So that, and the other thing too, is I think you need to look at, Tolf and I actually literally talked about this on our podcast last night. When you're, when you're going to be a coach for the season, I think you need to think about what age group you're coaching and what level. And you need to think about what, did, what should they have learned last year? What, what are their current strengths, weaknesses, all these things as a team and as individuals, more so as individuals. It's about personal development, I believe. And what are they going to need to be good at to make it to the next step in their career, the next goal? So like we talked about, if you're coaching midget players uh, and they're, you know, a bunch of them are trying to go play juniors next year, that year you need to be working on things that they need to be good at to make a, a junior team, I believe. So you're personally developing them to be ready for next Next year, as well as working on the stuff that they need to be good this year. So thinking about who you have, what's the age, what's the skill level, what do they need to work on this year? What do they need to be proficient at to make it to the next level? Progressions, regressions, and then just building relationships. Man, there's not there's not a conversation that goes by without you saying progressions and regressions <laughs> anymore. That's like your go-to thing right Daryl now. Belfry. Daryl Belfry. <laughs> oh man. Well, no, I mean, this is this has been great, guys. It, it's clear, like, you're thoughtful in in your approach to, you know, serving the people that listen to you and consume your information. So where can our listeners find you guys outside of the Hockey Think Tank podcast? 
Well, I don't know if you guys know this, but Jeff is verified on Instagram. He's got a blue yes. check mark next to his name. He's also made a shirt that has a blue check mark <laughs> on it as well. So you can find Jeff at Jeff Levecchio on Instagram, and that's all you need to know. That's right. <laughs> I, I well, actually, uh, I had a couple more, but if we still got right, go time. ahead, you're going to edit it. So I don't care. All right, perfect. <laughs> well, you guys talked about the last episode and I want to, I haven't gotten to listen to it yet. So for our listeners that might come over, what triggers you guys? <laughs> That's pretty funny, right? Like we just came up with that. Cause I, what was it? A couple episodes ago, somebody said something or did something that got me going. And Jeff was like, yes, yes. We love it. Like you got to do that again. Like I love when you get mad because I know it doesn't happen very often or whatever. So we just, uh, yeah, we just sent a note out to everybody on social media. And that was a really cool thing too, because we really kind of pride ourselves on the interaction that we get with people that listen to us. And we had, I think it was over a hundred people that either emailed us or DM'd us through social media of, of the, you know, things that trigger them in, in hockey. And, uh, it was cool too. Cause it was like parents, it was coaches, it was players. It was like all, all these people. So we tried to get to as much as we can. I don't know, Vex, like what the thing that triggers me the most, I think about hockey is when it's not about the kids, when it's about the adults and adult ego. I think that's the biggest thing that really rattles me about the machine, you know, is, is, is that a lot of times people are making decisions that's going to help their own ego rather than actually putting the kids first. And, uh, so I can go all day <laughs> uh, hockey director this year. So I saw a lot of stuff that I wish I didn't see and I wish I can unsee. Um, but at the end of the day, like make it about the kids, man. Like that's, that's the biggest thing. I think we, we called, we, I think we called people a joke who are, who like make it about themselves like 20 times at the end of the episode. We were coward. I think we said yeah. coward. Hope, joke. Hope yeah. got heated. I got heated. We were like, you're a joke. You are a joke. Like they were in front of us and we're like, make it about the kids. You're a joke. <laughs> we definitely got triggered. That's, that's incredible. When the, that's when that gets us for sure is people that lose sight of that. And believe me, I get it. You're going to get heated at times, but it's the people that don't reflect after they they do get heated and then make amends or stop getting heated and remember their why i have i'm a youth coach calm down jerry you're a youth coach karen sit in the stands don't yell at other parents it's about the kids you know so that that definitely gets us yeah and the, I, I, go ahead go ahead no, i was just gonna say the other thing too and we talked about this vex like don't try to bring people down to make yourself be better like that's the big like if you want to if you want to go anywhere in this hockey business let's call it like you do that by being good to people and by being a good person and by helping and providing value to people. You don't get anywhere in this business by bringing people down to make yourself look better. And I think that's kind of where the, the whole genesis of this whole triggered thing happened. And, and so that's like the biggest thing is like, don't, why be, why be negative about other people? And you guys know the youth hockey racket. It's all freaking gossip. It's all freaking talk like backdoor deals and all that BS, you know? So it's like, that's the kind of stuff that just, freaking yeah triggers yeah me. <laughs> and i gotta confess i gotta confess here right or wrong pavel barber triggers me because i just want to scream it's not gonna work in the game it's just not gonna work in the game but all right i promise last me one too. Me, last, no, yeah. no, me too but but i will say this though as somebody who like took training hand-eye coordination extremely yeah. seriously and i saw what that did for my game working on that off the ice for uh sure. i i do think a small percentage of what he's doing is good like like it's the dessert. It's the cherry on top only because it's going to help you like get a little bit of an extra risk. You're not going to do what he's doing in a game, but by practicing that fun stuff, you're having fun practicing and you're practicing a lot of hand eye and, and moving your body in funky ways that again, you're probably never, ever going to use, but it's making you more athletic. So I think that it will make you like 1% better, but you're right. Like I'm like, dude, this guy would come at me and I would literally just put my shoulder through his throat and he would die. Like, I think that all guys are always so nasty. I'm like, dude, I'll, I'll put my entire bank account on a one on one. <laughs> like, let's do it. You know? No, I actually saw a therapist for that one and it, uh, we, we worked it out. No, I'm just kidding. Um, all right. <laughs> last, last one here. Last one. We usually wrap with favorite memory. I might have stole this one from you guys as well. So, do you guys each have a quick uh, snippet of your favorite memory as, as a player in the game? Favorite memory? I, you know what? I think when you all, as hockey players, like, I think all of our favorite memories is team success, some kind of team success that you've had. Um, you know, I was able to win a championship in college with Cornell. Uh, we won the ECAC championship, got a goal away from the frozen four. So when you get to celebrate that 
that kind of achievement with guys you've gone to battle with and gone to war with and, and all that kind of stuff. I honestly don't think there's anything better than that. And, and one of my, it's tough to say favorite memories, but like one of my most, I guess, influential ones is playing against Wisconsin as a sophomore and to get to the frozen four and we end up losing the game in triple overtime. And it was like one of the worst moments of my entire life. But like when you go through something so hard and so tough with like a group of guys that you just, and you guys know, like those teams that just gel, like you're so close and you love each other and, 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 and all that kind of stuff. Like it's a really kind of special thing. So like being able to have those kinds of moments with guys that you just, yeah, like you sacrifice for and all that, and you know, they'll sacrifice for you too. There's nothing better than that. For me, for team one, it's actually kind of funny. I was thinking about this the other day. It wasn't actually like a real team I played on. It was a team I played on with TOEF, uh, Select 17. They used to be district by district, would play each other in the festival and the wit, you know, there's a championship and all that. And uh, there, we had a bunch of guys from St. Louis on Select 17, which was the first time that had happened in forever. Um, and so I got to play with TOEF, you know, uh, Illinois, Missouri, we're on Central District. We beat Michigan in the championship. And the kids on Michigan are kids that I overheard a few years earlier. They thought I was asleep and they were like, man, these kids from St. Louis aren't that bad at hockey. And they were like ripping on us for being from St. Louis because no teams had ever travel. So winning that tournament in the summer and it was the most fun team. We had unbelievable coaches. We had great chemistry for a team that only played together for like two weeks. It was so much fun. Um, and then personally would be my first real game back uh, from my concussion in the American League. I scored two goals. I thought I was never going to play again. I came in the dressing room that night for the game. There was an A on my jersey after missing a year and a half of hockey. I wound up scoring two goals, getting the first star. I was freaking crying on the ice and on the bench. You know, I thought I was never going to play again. So um, that experience is one that I'll definitely never forget for sure. That's awesome. Awesome stuff. And I mean, we could go on for hours here with you guys, but um, I really appreciate you coming on because like George said at the top, I mean, you guys inspired us to start sharing our thoughts on on all things hockey. And um, we'll try to stay in our lane and so that you guys can give the advice to the, the crazy hockey parents and and players and we'll stick to life after hockey. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> no, that's awesome, man. You guys are doing such a good job too. Gotten a chance to listen to you guys. We've got to have you guys on our podcast for sure to talk about the stuff that you're doing and uh, yeah, keep up the great work, man. This is great stuff. Awesome. Super fun. Thanks boys. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Guys. A lot of fun. We'll talk to you soon. And Jeff, I'm coming at you for a, a program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All message right. me, message me. Email. All right. Good deal. All right. See you fellas. All right. Bye.